I've got a love-hate relationship with that song. Uh, on the one hand, whenever I've had to lead it, when we've not had any instruments and I've had to lead the singing for it, I always get diverted off into Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs> the tunes start off the same and then divert, and I always get the wrong one. On the other hand, it mentions Royal David, and my ears prick up, and I think, oh, well, here we go. It's funny when you hear your name, isn't it? You can, you can hear your name in a crowded room. There can be talk. You, you don't know what's being said. You can't hear specific words, and then your name is said somewhere else in the room, and your ears prick up. Uh, if you're lucky enough that your name's in one of the carols or the hymns that we sing, you get to hear your name. If your name's Mary, for instance, or if your name's Joy, uh, or Grace, uh, or the wee girl we were saying there was Mercy, and she'll hear her name uh, when songs are sung. And likewise, when we invoke the name of Jesus, he hears. He hears his name and he answers. So let's call upon him tonight as we look into his word. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we thank you for this time when we remember your birth and we also remember your death because you came to die. You came to give. You came to give your life so that we might have life because we were dead in sin and had no hope. And so we come with thanksgiving, with joy this evening. And we ask that you'll help us to hear your word, to understand your word, and to respond in gratefulness and in joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Just eight days till Christmas, or uh, some people say, and I don't like it when people say there's eight sleeps to Christmas, partly because sometimes I like an afternoon nap, so there might be more than eight sleeps, uh, and I can't really predict until the days have gone by. Uh, but some of you will be planning trips to see family or maybe having family around to your place uh, for Christmas dinner. You all gather around the table. And I hope you have a lovely time if, if that's happening. But it's also a dangerous time, isn't it? It's a time when uh, conversations are sparked and sometimes people say things that other people disagree with. There can be family squabbles. It may be about politics. It might be about a problem in the family, uh, maybe a particular relative. Or sometimes it seems like Uncle Joe's lost his senses as he tries to argue that man never went to the moon, or Elvis didn't really die in 77 and he's still alive somewhere. These kind of things sometimes crop up, and controversies and squabbles and quarrels can be things that happen around the family table at Christmas. Paul knows there are similar, similar controversies and similar squabbles happening in the church at Ephesus. And so he wants to help Timothy deal with them in the best way possible. The first word in our passage tonight was so. Now, I can't pass that by without going backwards because whenever you hear the word so as part of a passage, it's obviously referring back to what has just been said. So let's remind ourselves uh, what the passage so far has said. All the way through chapter 2, Paul has been telling us about good people, good people of different occupations. He talked about a good soldier, remember? A good soldier endures hardship, fights for the one who enlists him. He talked about a good athlete who trains hard, who follows the rules, who disciplines his body. He talked about a good farmer. A good farmer works hard to bring in the crop and is the first to get to taste it. He talked about a good prisoner. Paul was talking about himself as he referred to the, the punishment that he'd had to endure for the sake of Christ realizing that he's in prison there for, for Jesus and is in prison for the sake of those who believe in Jesus. He calls them the elect. Paul talked about a good worker who studies to show himself approved before God. And he talked about a good vessel. Remember last week Nathan was talking about the, the various vessels of gold and silver and wood and clay uh, and how they can be used for honorable use or dishonorable use. And they can be cleaned, they can be cleansed so that they can be then used 
for honour in the great house. Notice the kind of common thread through all these examples that Paul has used. In every one of them, there is a a self-sacrifice for a greater good, enduring hardship, being disciplined, working hard, suffering unjustly, studying deeply, cleaning out. These are all things that take effort and they can be painful, but they're done for a higher goal. They're done for a greater gain, defending a country, winning a prize, feeding a village, spreading the gospel, building up the saints and glorifying God. These are things that are worth suffering for, worth giving for, worth sacrificing ourselves for. And when the rewards are so high, it makes the sacrifice worthwhile. Paul is trying to teach Timothy that. Think of the Old Testament sacrifices. The Israelites were called to bring their very best before the Lord. The crop that they had grown, they had to bring the first fruits, the the freshest, best of of what they had grown, or, or they were called to bring the best of the flock before the Lord and present it to Him. Give it to Him. That wasn't a small thing. That was a costly thing for them. And yet they brought these offerings to the Lord because they knew that what they would receive would be greater. Forgiveness for sin. The guidance and strength of the Holy Spirit. A God who fought their battles for them. A blessing on their nation. These were things that were worth giving your best for. Because God could give so much more in return. And so Paul calls Timothy to give much to the Lord, to give his best even for the greater blessing, a blessing for him, a blessing for the church at Ephesus that he's leading, and for the greater good of God's kingdom throughout the ages. Paul says, give of yourself. So, we get to that word at the start of our passage. Paul has shown us what God wants us to be. And now Paul shows Timothy the path. Here's Paul's training regime to make us fit to serve God through hardship and testing. You know these, uh, when you get in a film, you get these montage scenes where they're kind of building up and working towards the goal and you see clips from the progress that they make. Well, this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, here, this is what I want you to do, Timothy, so that you can be ready, so that you can be fit so that you can be trained to work for the Lord. He wants to build character. Now, I don't know if you've ever taken a holiday in Scotland. It can be beautiful. We live in a beautiful country, and it can be the loveliest place to visit, but it's a risk. Depending on the vagaries of the the Scottish weather, you could get glorious sunshine, or you could get mist, or rain, or even hailstones in the middle of summer. And then the afternoon could be something different. I remember taking family holidays uh, down the Clyde uh, at Girvan. It was a a location we went to several times. And I can remember putting in the grass by the beach. It was lovely. Uh, I can remember uh, going in the wee motorboats round and round the the circuit that they had. And I particularly remember climbing the Bine Hill in Girvan in the pouring rain in our big jackets. And when we got to the top, there was a, uh, a big stone thing that told you what places were off in different directions. But you couldn't see them because it was so misty that you couldn't really see anything. And what we were told was it was character building. It will be good for you. You see, building character is hard work. It can be painful. And it takes time. How did Paul want Timothy to build a faithful character? Let's look at the the verses we were reading earlier. Verse 22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. What are youthful passions that we should flee? Well, they're the things that occupy our hearts and our minds, especially when we're young, our passions, our, our, our wants, our needs, our lusts even. 
money, fame, adventure, relationships, these are things that occupy our thoughts sometimes. And if they take too much of our thoughts, they can take away from God. Other translations call them youthful lusts or evil desires of youth. They are the things that take your mind off God when you're in the church service. Or perhaps they're even the things that you're occupied with that mean you don't even come to the church service. They're the things that the world will tell you are necessary for a fulfilled life. But Paul says they're dangers against building a faithful character. These are things that we should flee, he says, when we are tempted to follow these ways that seem exciting, but we know are dangerous, we should flee from them. But we can't just stop doing one thing and just have an empty life, a life that is vacant, because we'll just tend back towards what we were doing before. And instead, Paul says to pursue, to fill your life with other things. He says, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Seek out opportunities to do good, to befriend, to encourage, and to share. Paul wants Timothy to flee from youthful passions and to follow what is good. I've got two things to add to that. Firstly, this isn't just written to young people. He talks about youthful passions, but all of us, uh, still to some extent, as the older we get, uh, still have these things that can draw us away from the right walk with God, that can draw us away from Christ. So it's not just the youth he's talking to. They might be the most full of energy and ready to go, but they can also eat away at our spiritual life when we're older. We need to be vigilant about the things that occupy our minds. And secondly, we're not going through this alone. Paul says to pursue all these good things along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Isn't that great? There's a lot of work involved, but we can walk with each other on this path. And we can seek to bring brothers and sisters back onto the path when they stray, as he says, when they swerve from the truth. We can seek to draw them back onto the right path. Now, there's some disagreement about what Paul meant by youthful passions. Uh, what I've just talked about is what some of the commentators agree with. However, some others say that Timothy has already shown himself to be uh, above youthful lusts. He's shown himself to be faithful in avoiding these sort of sinful things. So Paul must be warning about a sort of higher-minded youthful passion. Calvin suggests that young people uh, are more prone to hotly argue a point, being confident in themselves that they're right and jumping in with both feet. And he thinks that's what Paul is warning Timothy about, to be sure of yourself and to be jumping in and being fighting for a point. And he's saying, beware of that. And that does chime quite well with the next verse. Look at verse 23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Some of us just love a good argument. We can take the smallest thing and we can argue one side against the other. And we're great at putting together an argument. Even for something we don't feel that strongly about, we can get behind it and we can build up our evidence and we can take a firm stance on something. Whether it's a political position or the best way to make a cup of tea, don't, don't put the milk in first, that's just wrong. We can have strong opinions about these kind of things. And sometimes it can be about the correct interpretation of what the Bible tells us. Sometimes we can stand strongly on what we believe the Bible is saying and someone else can think it says something a bit different. And what's the point of an argument? The point is to win, isn't it? And in winning, we create division. And that's a problem that Paul wants Timothy to avoid and it's a problem that we need to avoid. How much better, rather than creating division, if we can work together to seek truth. 
Think about that last verse we read. There were different ideas about the phrase youthful passions, weren't there? We could start debating about which interpretation was right. Is it this or is it that? You could take one side and I could take the other and we could build up our arguments and we could argue our case. Do you know what would happen? The more that we talked about it, the more we argued about it, the more polar we would be. You would be stuck in your position and I would be stuck in mine because we wanted to win. The more entrenched we would become and the less likely to admit that the other side had a point. We would end up divided on opinion and possibly hurt by each other's verbal attacks. How much better if we worked together to study what the Word says and find out what we can learn from the passage from different angles. After all, if some of the great Bible scholars of the past couldn't agree on exactly what it meant then, who are we to be so firm that we are right? And so Paul says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Of course, sometimes we do know for sure. Sometimes someone comes up with something that's just plain wrong. We know our Bibles and we know what they're saying is wrong. And this seems to be what Timothy has encountered in Ephesus. As Paul mentioned Hymenaeus and Philetus in verse 17, he said they have swerved from the truth. They were saying that the resurrection had already happened and it's causing problems because it's, it's testing the faith and upsetting the faith of some of the brothers and sisters in the church in Ephesus. This situation needs addressing because falsehood is spreading. And Paul's suggestion of how it's addressed is surprising. Look at verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. That's not what I expected to read. I expected Paul to want Timothy to stamp down hard on these wrong thoughts and wrong ideas and dangerous nonsense. And maybe it would eventually come to that if he couldn't change their minds. But what Paul suggests first is that kindness is better than quarreling. Timothy is to teach and correct, but to do with kindness, patience and gentleness. They aren't usually words that you see when you're talking about arguing a point, are they? Kindness, patience and gentleness. But that's what Paul wants Timothy to have. That's the sort of character he wants to build up in him. And that's actually harder than being forceful and just stepping in and saying this is the truth. How would you even go about it to be kind and bringing someone to the truth? The first clue that we get in here is how Paul refers to patiently enduring the evil. Hear them out. Listen to what the other person is saying carefully. Even though you know they've got falsehood, you know they're wrong, listen to what they're saying. Ask them how they came to that opinion. Find out what scriptures or thought processes led them to this belief. And only once they've fully explained themselves, take them through their error step by step. That takes skill. That takes knowledge. It requires a solid foundation in the Word of God. But that's what Paul has been urging Timothy from the start of the chapter. Be disciplined. Train hard. Work hard. Study to show yourself approved. And train up others so that they too will be able to gently correct and keep their brothers and sisters from swerving from the truth. Look at verse 1 of the chapter. You then, my child... Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy's job was to know the scriptures, to understand the scriptures, but also to pass them on to others so that they could then teach others as well and gently and carefully bring them back to the truth, to the right way. 
And by the way, don't assume that you have to know all the answers. All of us are, are learning. All of us are, are coming closer as we read to the Word of God, but all of us still have a long way to go. And I'm sure some of these faithful men would turn to Timothy sometimes and say, look, I don't understand this. Can you explain it? And sometimes Timothy would have said, well, I don't understand either. And if Paul was there, he could have gone to Paul. Otherwise, he would go to the Lord. And sometimes we just need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't understand what you're saying here. Help me to understand. Show me your truth. So what's the outcome of all this? Well, if we quarrel, if we argue our side, determined to win, we will either win or lose. Whatever the outcome, there will be division. If we can get alongside someone and carefully take them through the Scriptures, at the very least we will have shown them that we care and love them. And we care about their spiritual well-being. And at best... Well, that's where Paul goes on. He says, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Have you ever had a friend who was ill and you've been praying for them? You've been praying for recovery and they get better. How do you feel? Joyous. Wonderful, great, happy for them, thankful for what God has done. You probably prayed for them while they were ill. You probably prayed for a full recovery. And it's the same for those who have swerved from the truth, who have taken up a wrong position. Our aim shouldn't be to shut them down and put them out, but to restore them with kindness and love. As well as gently teaching them, we should be praying for them that God could lead them to repentance. Paul says they've been caught in a snare by the devil. You don't see a snare when you approach it. A snare to catch an animal is usually hidden. And when they put a leg through it or put their neck through it, it catches them and holds them. And there's nothing they can do themselves to get out of it. The only way they can be freed from it is if someone else comes along and helps. Paul wants Timothy to help these folk who have swerved from the way to get them out of the snare that the devil has set for them. Hopefully they can come to their senses. Do you remember someone else in the Bible who came to their senses? Prodigal son. He had made bad choices. He had taken his inheritance money early, throwing it away in wild living. And he ended up in a terrible situation. He ended up in the lowliest of jobs. He ended up feeding pigs. And he was in such a state that he looked at what the pigs were eating and thought, oh, I could have some of that. I'm so hungry. And the Bible says, and he came to his senses. He realized the position he was in and realized he needed to turn around. And he went back to his father's house and asked his father if he could be a servant in his household. And what did his father do? He ran to him and he hugged him and he put his robe and his ring on him and he laid on a feast to celebrate his return. That's what God wants for those who are far from him, for those who have turned away from him. He wants them to return. He wants them to come to their senses. You see, the truth is important, but people are important to the Lord. And when we see those who have made poor decisions return to the flock, we should rejoice and celebrate. So I hope you have a pleasant time at Christmas time. I hope you are able to spend some time with loved ones and have good conversations. And when controversies arise, let's not be quarrelsome. Let's not have an argument. Let's try and be kind. Even more so in the church. Let's encourage one another and build each other up. Talk about the Bible. Discuss what it says. 
As Paul says in verse 1, let us be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and learn together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you so much that you love the people that you created. We thank you that when we stray from you, your desire is to seek us out and to bring us back. Lord, help us to love one another, to see where people have swerved from the truth and to gently, carefully seek to bring them back, looking to you to reach out to them and to free them from the snare of the devil. Father, help us to love one another, encourage one another, and build each other up. In Jesus' name, amen.